everyone, and welcome to Capital Literature 2022, the International Literary Festival held in Sofia, Bulgaria since 2009 and organized by the Elizabeth Kustova Creation for Creative Writing. Uh, hello, I'm Violetta, the director, and for those of you who are, who are new to our organization, the foundation was founded in 2007 by American writer Elizabeth Kustova in public interest with a mission to support Bulgarian writers and Bulgarian literature, but also so much more. 15 years later, the Elizabeth Kostova Foundation is creating meaningful, lasting, and beautiful literary bridges between Bulgaria and the Anglosphere. Uh, Elizabeth is here with us today too, so I hope she joins. So she says hi. There she is. Hello, Elizabeth. So lovely to see you and meet you. Uh, our 2022 Capital Literature Program, Writing to Save the World, features a series of public lectures and creative writing workshops on writing in response to the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced, the climate emergency. I'm delighted to welcome a nonfiction writer, curator, activist, and professor Lacey M. Johnson. Her award-winning works include two memoirs, Trespasses and a Haunting the Other Side, and uh, the essay collection, The Reckonings. In her work, Lacey confronts issues such as the epidemic of violence against women and investigates the concepts of mercy and forgiveness, reflecting on her own deeply personal experiences. Her latest book, More City Than Water, the Houston Flood Atlas, is a collection of flood stories from her hometown, a region that is increasingly defined by flooding. Her work has appeared in Best American Essays, Best American Travel Writing, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, Paris Review, and elsewhere. She teaches creative nonfiction at Rice University and is the founding director of the Houston Flood Museum. Joining her as discussion moderator is Konstantin Georgiev, a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at Rice University. His doctoral uh, research focuses on the politics of environmental science in Soviet and post-Soviet Siberia. Konstantin has also worked in analog film preservation and is currently coordinating the International Documentary Film Festival, Sofia Documento. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I would ask our viewers to please post your questions in the Q&A option below. And now, Elizabeth, over to you. Hello, everyone. It's, it's wonderful that we can gather this way. I know we all miss being in person in Sofia and many other cities. And I welcome everybody. And we're very proud to be hosting a lot of distinguished writers and very creative talents from two sides of an ocean and, and maybe several oceans about this extremely, extremely urgent set of concerns for our world. It's easy to feel overwhelmed these days, but I think having these discussions is a step in the right direction for each of us as, as individual writers. And thank you so much, Violetta, for hosting us as well. You're welcome. Okay, Kose, now over to you and the discussion with Lacey. I'm looking forward to it. Sure, well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, as Violetta said, the Q&A uh, is open. Uh, but first, before we start the conversation and before I start the discussion with some questions uh, I've got prepared for Lacey, uh, let's first hear an excerpt uh, from the article after which this current uh, discussion is named after. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Violetta. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Constantine, um, for joining us and for this lovely invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to read just a short excerpt from um, the article that appeared in The New Yorker called How to Mourn a Glacier. Um, and it was about the first um, funeral held for a glacier lost to climate change, um, the Okjokult Glacier in Iceland. Um, there was a funeral in August of 2019, so we're coming up on the three-year anniversary um, of the memorial. 
Um, and in writing the article, one of the things that I was interested in was the idea that there was, um, you know, that everyone was saying that the glacier had died, um, of course, but um, as you'll see in a moment, it, it raised a question for me. If we can say something has died, can we also say it once lived? A few days before the memorial ceremony for Occult, I met Sigurdsson, who's a glaciologist um, who declared um, the glacier was no longer living, that it was dead ice. Um, I met him for coffee on an uncommonly sunny morning in Reykjavik, hoping to learn more about why he had chosen to frame the loss of the glacier as a death. For glaciologists, Sigurdsson has amassed an unusual degree of celebrity. His phone rang several times as we talked, and he admitted that he was not used to the attention. He was looking forward to a trip with his wife the next week to celebrate their anniversary. Sigurdsson brightened when I asked him about glaciers. They are enormously interesting as a natural phenomenon, he said. Partly his passion was aesthetic. They just shine, he said. But he was also interested in why they surge suddenly and without explanation. When I asked him directly if glaciers were living, he hesitated. Things that grow and move, we tend to consider animate, he said, even if we resist the idea that every animate thing has a soul. A healthy glacier grows each winter more than it melts each summer, moves on the ground under its own weight, and is at least partially covered with a thick fur-like layer of snow. Glaciers also move on their insides, especially in Iceland, where the glaciers are made of temperate ice, which exists right at the melting point. This sets them apart from the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, which are frozen and older by hundreds of thousands of years. In Iceland, Sigurdsson said the oldest ice was born more than a thousand years ago, before the Little Ice Age, on the north side of Vatnajökull, the largest glacier in the country. Vatnajökull is roughly the area of Delaware and Rhode Island combined and stands almost as tall as the Empire State Building. Okjokult, by comparison, was small and young when it died. Ice covered the mountaintop for only a few centuries. Sigurdsson knows this because he had counted the glacier's rings, which were formed by dust each year, not unlike the rings on a tree. The rings contained a sort of memory, a record of pollen clouds, volcanic eruptions, cold wars, and nuclear meltdowns. When a glacier melts, Sigurdsson says, its memory disappears. Having memory is just one of the many ways scientists refer to glaciers in terms that make them seem alive. They also crawl, have toes. When they break off at the ablation edge, they are said to have calved. They are born and die, the latter at increasing rates, especially during the great thaw of the past 20 years. When Sigurdsson conducted a glacier inventory in the early 2000s, he found more than 300 glaciers in Iceland. A repeat inventory in 2017 revealed that 56 had disappeared. Many of them were small glaciers in the highlands, which had spent their lives almost entirely unseen. Quote, most of them didn't even have names, he told me, but we have been working with local people to name every glacier so that they will not go unbaptized. Now he intends to complete their death certificates and bring a stack of them to meetings. The next to go, he thinks, will be Hofsjokult to the east. Thank you so much, Lacey, uh, for introducing this article to us. And I want to, well, first to remind everyone that the Q&A section of this um, um, webinar is open for everyone who wants to ask something. And I wanted to start a conversation from a rather broad place, but uh, just what brought you to, you know, creating right. nonfiction as a genre and way of expressing yourself, and and then a little bit more specifically, what brought you, of course, to the uh, uh, to the funerary ceremony, basically, of of this glacier. Um, what brought me to creative nonfiction? So I. Um, I actually trained, all of my um, training is as a poet, um, actually. And I 
study poetry in grad school, in um, undergrad. I was convinced I wanted to be a poet. Um, but then I started realizing that the work that I wanted to do could not be contained in the poetic form and that poetry, um, although it is capable of many things, that what was considered acceptable form in poetry was somewhat limiting for the stories that I wanted to tell. And in particular, I'm thinking of the story um, you know, that's um, told in The Other Side, my second memoir, which is about um, sort of terrible violence that I experienced in my life, um, that I wanted to sort of expand slightly the poetic form. And ex what I found was that by expanding poetry enough to accommodate um, more narrative, more images, more sort of vignette storytelling, um, that then it sort of had shifted across an invisible line and became creative nonfiction. In my view, there's n like the line between those things is quite smudgy, but ever since I've been a creative nonfiction writer. Um, and increasingly over time, my work has been become more journalistic, I guess, in nature. Um, and people who are coming to an article to read journalism don't have a lot of patience for reading poetry, I think. Um, that's not what they're looking for. So um, it's becoming more and more prosaic, I guess. It still has poetry in it, but it is not poetry. Um, but what brought me specifically to the mountain in Iceland was that I had been... Um, thinking and studying and researching about glaciers, I think for a little while, for a few years. And my colleagues, um, Simone Howe and Dominic Boyer, who I'm sure you know, who are in the Rice Anthropology Department, um, they had been working on glaciers in Iceland. They had made this documentary um, about Icelandic glaciers and specifically about Auk and um, the melting of Auk. And when it came time for them to do, um, they, when they were planning the memorial, they invited me to come. And um, so I did, and I um, you know, pitched the New Yorker and said, I'm going to this funeral for a glacier loss to climate change. Can I write about it for you? Um, and they said, yes. So that was how I found myself there. And what was the compelling, the most compelling part of this project in terms of the way you describe, especially in this paragraph that you, this excerpt you just read, uh, there is this effort to describe the glacier as a almost animate object. And you don't invent this, you take this from the uh, glaciologist, but what is the appeal of such, of such uh, an approach and, and why is it important to, uh, you know, more great glaciers or maybe not only glaciers? Sure, I think it applies to not only glaciers that um, I think one of the things I had been thinking about in advance of writing this was just, you know, about the animacy of the living world, right? And how the way, the kind of, I guess that, the way of talking about the world that we have inherited from, you know, frankly, white European men um, to talk about the world sort of diminishes the animacy of it, that it's nature is separate from us. It's not living, it's static, it's, it's almost dead that we accord ourselves with life and animacy and souls and that, um, you know, the, the living world is a resource to be exploited, right? Um, and that sort of diminishing its life allows us to commit terrible violence toward it. Um, so I had been thinking about this and then, you know, to hear that um, this glaciologist had been, had, you know, written a death certificate for this glacier, um, that there are ways that we are beginning to talk about the death of the world at a time when it's too late 
it's, it's almost too late. It's not necessarily too late, but um, to sort of recognize the way that it has always been living. Um, and so that was one of the things that appealed, or I guess, and not necessarily appealed, but drew me um, to writing this particular article and drew me to the subject of this particular glacier. And in this conversation, you already mentioned, you know, this violence that let's say humanity and grow, but maybe our current political systems, particularly are uh, the violence they're inactive, uh, enacting on to the nature world. Do you, what, what's, the, what's the way you envision or how do you think writing or reading could have an effect? Uh, you know, how can it change our relation, our uh, attitudes toward, towards the, the natural world? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's an importance that, you know, one of the things that writing does that's important is writing conveys narrative, right? It's storytelling. Um, that when you spend time in a story, you are committing an act of generosity, right? To give your attention um, to this subject, to, um, you know, the lives that you were reading about. And I think, um, telling stories about the, the world that portray it in a, that offer an alternate view, right? And it's not as if, um, I or any other writer are making this up. Like, it's not my idea that the world is living. That is, a very old idea that has been erased and eradicated through, you know, through violence. Um, but we can, I think we can and should work to reanimate those stories, to bring them back to light, um, to sort of do the work of exca excavating them, I guess, from that violence of erasure. Um, and that's one of the, you know, the best possible things that we can do is sort of share these other ways, tell these stories that um, are not new, but are quite old and um, allow people to give their attention and to enter into that, um, into that realm of possibility. I think that offers hope, I think, when, when it seems hard to come by these days. I, I, actually, I had in mind a couple of other questions before we reach to this one, but since you already mentioned the keyword hope, I was mm. wondering as, as a person who, who has written about all kinds of trauma, personal or, or now collective in, in, in the context of crisis, environmental or otherwise, how do you know, and the, most of the narratives we find in such, in writing on such topics, they're all about doom and gloom. And mm. it's very hard sometimes to be hopeful and optimistic. And I and you kind of seem to be able to to maintain this uh, positivity. So I was kind of curious, how do you do it? Is it an intentional effort, or how how do you you know how do you maintain hope in this in those gloomy contexts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's not optimism, you know, because optimism is. Um, you know, if you think about pessimism and optimism as opposites, right? Pessimism is the belief that nothing's going to work out no matter what we do, that it doesn't matter what we try, everything is going to be awful. And optimism is the idea that no matter what we do, everything's going to turn out great. Like we don't actually need to do anything. It's all going to work out in the end. Um, and hope is different from those things, which is the belief that we can orient ourselves toward possibility and that that kind of orientation of the spirit in um, Vaclav Havel's term is, um, is the belief that something can happen and that by believing in that possibility, we open up um, opportunities for ourselves um, that give us room for action that can change the outcome of the future. You know, I think sometimes about, and I talk to my students about this sometimes, that, you know, there's this really popular trope in science fiction storytelling and like movies that, um, for example, or novels or whatever, that 
you can travel like in time travel, right? That you can time travel to the past and that some small action can have radical consequences for the future, right? You do something tiny in the past, like think back to the future. You do something tiny in the past and it really changes the trajectory of what we would consider the present. But we, what we don't tend to accept is that there are small things that we can do today that will have radical outcomes in the future, right? That there are small things that we can do right now that change the path that we are on. Um, and so I, I believe in that, in that possibility that, um, you know, that there are, you know, and, and I guess I'm a disciple of um, the writer Rebecca Solnit in this. She writes a lot about hope. Um, that I think we have a kind of moral obligation to be oriented toward possibility. Uh, before my next question, I wanted to remind people that the Q&A, uh, I mean, viewers uh, in particular, that the Q&A is open if anyone has any questions. Um, and now, since you, since you mentioned cli-fi, well, sci-fi you mentioned, but I immediately thought of climate fiction, which has been a topic actually of a previous discussion in, in a previous uh, seminar discussion in this uh, festival this year. I'm kind of curious, and since you've written about environmental topics, not only in terms of how you mourn a glacier, but also uh, more city than water, which is uh, a book that I hope we can discuss later on in this conversation. But how do how do genres compare? You already mentioned that the line for you between poetry and creative nonfiction is quite smudgy. Uh, would you consider that the line between, let's say, a memoir and a science book is as smudgy as that one, or is it different? And in particular, kind of kind of want to ask in terms of changing attitudes and in terms of you know, doing these small actions that can potentially put us on a better path. How does, how does creative nonfiction, you know, mm, fares better or worse compared to, let's say, science fiction or uh, popular science books? And here, of course, I have the very cliche example of uh, Silent Spring, which mm -hmm. was a science book, essentially, that helped kickstart the, the U.S. environmental movement of the, let's say, late 60s. Uh, so yeah, I'm kind of curious, in your opinion, memoirs or creative nonfiction more broadly, how do they do better or worse than, let's say, those other genres that we've mentioned? I mean, I don't have a sense of like how to compare, because I think that it's all a kind of web of relationships, right? That, I mean, even before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, um, there was a lot of climate science fiction being written, right? Um, you know, about um, the kind of horror of um, extraction and sort of seeing environmental degradation. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, I mean, even in, um, oh, I feel like now I'm, having an exam, <laughs> I was like trying to think of the different authors, but thinking about like, um, you know, I mean, I think there are some kinds of science fiction that began, you know, during the industrial revolution, right? We're thinking about like, um, um, like, uh, uh, I'm totally blanking. <laughs> I hate it when that happens when I get put on the spot. Um, but anyway, trust me, there's science fiction that began during, you know, the Industrial Revolution. And it was about um, the sort of landscape changing and sort of that's one of the things that science fiction does is that it sort of like casts a future to be able to talk about or cast a future an alternate present to be talk about to talk about the world that we are in right now. Right. It sort of, you know, refracts the light back so that we can see ourselves. So that was already happening and, and that kind of um, writing already existed well before Rachel Carson was writing Silent Spring. Um, there was, you know, civil rights movements. There were activists talking about the land. There, was, there had been indigenous removal here in the United States. There was already a kind of, um, you know, 
conversation around these issues before Rachel Carson came along. And no doubt, I mean, it's impossible to sort of extract that context from her work. She had to have been informed by that to some degree. Um, you know, she'd been working in, you know, on, on marine issues for quite a long time before that. So I think, you know, and my own work has been informed by fiction, by science fiction in particular, by climate fiction. Um, and I think that that, um, you know, all of that work of, of telling stories about the world and sort of showing it to ourselves in alternate ways um, is important. I'm not going to say one is more important than the other. But what nonfiction can do in particular that I think um, it might not be so easy in something like fiction or in poetry is talk about solutions, um, you know, to sort of share reportage. I was at a conference recently, the Society of Environmental Journalists that met here in Houston in the spring. And um, there was one panel about how talking about solutions in your climate reporting or in any work that you do on the climate, even if it's failed solutions, um, you know, that people tried something and it didn't work. Like people's hope, <laughs> it, it just increases it, right? That when you talk about the problem, that there's just this doom and gloom, everything's bad, we're all screwed, um, and, and just end there, that people have a sense of hopelessness. They don't, and despair and inaction. It can lead to inaction and despair. And that's not what we want. That I think creative nonfiction in particular, um, nonfiction more broadly, whether it's science writing or um, memoir writing, we can talk about what works and what doesn't. And even seeing that people trying something and it not quite working out, sort of somehow um, short circuits that despair response that that people it leaves people with the idea that like oh I can I can try something too right oh but I want to add that I don't think that writing is the end-all be-all like it's like we can't just write about it and not do anything right it has to be followed by action um, and so I do think that sort of solutions part um, is a really important piece of the puzzle is thinking about, you know, which doesn't necessarily mean that a writer needs to come up with a solution themselves, but it's useful to write about what other people have tried or are trying or are planning to try. Um, that I think that's a, that's a useful piece of the puzzle. And in the last couple of uh, questions and answers that we exchanged, you mentioned uh, a few times already, I believe, uh, different temporalities and orientations, orientations towards the future or alternative or imagining alternative presents and alternative courses on which we might be headed. And I kind of wanted to take this and return back to the uh, New Yorker essay, uh, how to mm -hmm. be here, where on a couple of occasions, there is this discussion about linking the present moment to, to the future. And I was kind of kind of curious how do we, I mean, the question that I was thinking of in advance was kind of what are the specific mechanisms in writing or reading that can teach us to kind of, you know, take our current uh, experience and project it toward the future. And you kind of already spoke to this quite a bit. So I'm kind of looking to twisting the question a little bit and, and adding a little bit more effective shape on it because the this particular phrase, if I'm not mistaken, the essay was the intimacy of the future, that this is what we're looking forward. And here we enter those murky waters of, you know, can we imagine precisely what it's gonna be? And I was kind of curious maybe to hear you speak a little bit more to those ideas of why is it important to, you know, feel the future as something close, intimately close to us instead mm. of some, just abstract time that's yet to come and yeah just based on sure. that experience yeah i mean i think so that phrase the intimate time of the future is actually um andre 
Meng, uh, the, the writer, that's his phrase. So I don't um, want to claim that. And he writes more about that in um, a book that was released, I think last year called On Time and Water. So I just want to plug that for him. Um, but sort of, I think his argument that he's making is that um, he's trying to sort of, he's using that phrase to connect us to you know, to sort of help us realize how far into the future our actions extend. So he writes about his connection to his grandmother, about being, you know, sort of sitting at the foot of his grandfather, his grandmother, hearing her stories about um, sort of going up on the glaciers, being part of these sort of um, glacial research teams, glacier exploration teams. I don't remember exactly the sort of like, um, the name of the group that she was part of, but um, but hearing her stories and sort of being informed by that and sort of being brought into um, that that relationship was a kind of intimate time, that he was in the intimate time of his grandmother's life and feeling in his life the impact of her actions. Um, and he says that um, what he wants to help us understand is that then what was ha what is happening right now will be felt hundreds of years, you know, like not just by our grandchildren, but by our grandchildren's grandchildren, that I will tell my grandchild about um, this memorial that we are at today. And they would tell their grandchild about it. And that there I am in this sort of intimate time of my um, great grandchild or great great grandchild's life is the sort of um, argument that he's making, and I think um, I have a slightly different take on it, which is that we have a kind of fetishistic, I guess, relationship with the past, right? With this sort of, especially of the this idea of the historic past, and I'm and when I say we, I guess I mean primarily you know, the United States, but perhaps this is true in Europe as well. This idea of the sort of heroism of our ancestors, you know, and in the United States, that history is quite short. <laughs> it's only, you know, what, 250 years that this country has existed and it's, you know, in this particular form. And, you know, but that's many, many, many lifetimes of humans. But like I was just at, um, a few weeks ago, I was at the Sequoia National Park here in the United States. It's in California. And those trees, some of those trees are 3,000 years old, right? And, but our action, you know, but last year during the fires that, um, the wildfires that were happening in the National Forest, you know, some of those trees, you know, the whole swaths of the forest were damaged, but some of the oldest trees, those thousands of year old trees, they were wrapped by by, you know, foil to protect them. And, and just the way that our actions are sort of erasing these lives that are far longer than our own and these records of time, um, that there's, there's no sort of sense of geologic time, um, that we have a, just a terrible um, incapacity to imagine it um, because we can only imagine I don't know. I mean, can you imagine the world five years from now, 10 years from now? It's getting increasingly difficult. Now think about a thousand years from now. It's, it's wildly, you know, impossible. But when we start thinking about maybe um, another metaphor for this is, you know, I've heard people talking about maybe rather than talking about like your climate footprint, thinking about your climate shadow. Um, so what kind of shadow are we casting into the future? And sort of thinking about how long we can imagine it extending and that it's not just my child's life, my grandchild's life, you know, and, and thinking about a community that's larger than just my sort of biological relations, but including um, the living world in, in who I consider my relations and how my actions now will impact them a thousand years, 2000 years, thinking along these lifetimes that are far longer than our own. Um, I think that's one of the challenges that I'm struggling with right now in my writing is just um, how do I convey, help people to sort of imagine those longer um, timelines, that sort of more distant future.
I, I think I'm, I want to use this these last few sentences as a segue to maybe move a little bit towards more city than water because mm. uh, it's a book uh, and please feel free to talk a little bit more in, about it and introduce people to it but it's a book in which you gather histories uh, from the Houston area and those are histories that and full disclosure the book just came out and I haven't read it yet uh, but I assume, based on my experience with Houston, that a, a, a lot of the histories and the personal histories, especially, uh, the past in them is this very repetitive recurrent past of flood after flood after flood. Mm -hmm. And yet the future horizon is probably the one, the, the future horizon of rebuilding here and now. Uh, so I'm kind of curious if you think, well, first of all, if you think that there is a different orientation towards temporal horizons in in situations where it, it affects us personally like a flood versus climate change that affects us kind of in a more abstract way it doesn't take our home away immediately so I'm kind of curious on that and also where's writing's role or your book maybe in particular's role into equalizing those different temporal orientations and effective maybe orientations sure so I mean, this isn't um, specifically in the book, but what I, you know, I learned a lot while working on this book and um, I'll say just a little about it. So I am one of the editors of the book, um, More City Than Water. It's a collection of essays and poetically rendered maps um, that are about flooding in Houston um, and contributors include writers, novelists, anthropologists, um, housing activists, landscape architects, um, lots of people coming from a lot of different backgrounds to write about um, this issue and, and their experience with it. Um, but one of the things that I learned in the process of working on this is that, um, you know, like the flood maps. Here, so um, I'm not sure if in other places um, they, they have these, but, you know, the sort of uh, FEMA every year or not every year, but every so often issues these um, flood maps and it sort of describes your risk for flooding. And, you know, we talk about the flood plain, you're in the 100 year flood plain or the 500 year flood plain or the thousand year flood plain. And that sort of describes your likelihood of being flooded in a given year. Um, that that all of the data that goes into um, issuing the, the, those maps is based on the past, right? It's, it's based on what has already happened and is not a projection of what, it, it doesn't take into account the sort of like escalating um, severity or um, even the frequency, I guess, of the kind of, um, oh, thank you, the federal, <laughs> I should have said what, the, what FEMA stands for. Um, but it doesn't take into account the sort of the way, the kind of sharp curve of likelihood and severity that we're experiencing in the climate crisis, right? Um, it's only based on the past and it includes not just the sort of recent data, but the sort of far distant data and aggregates that. Um, but, you know, the sort of like increasing likelihood of flooding is worse every year. And it's based not just on precipitation, it's also based on um, land use and development and how, you know, here in Houston, um, part of what contributes to our flooding is the way we live on the land. I mean, Houston was founded on land that is a coastal prairie and, um, you know, the, the way that prairie grass works. I mean, it's a, um, it's the soils here are very, um, there's a lot of clay in the soils. So it sort of holds the water in place. It's not very absorbent. Um, and what the prairie grass did was um, sort of create, you know, in permeating its roots into those clay soils, um, make the soil more absorbent. But we have taken the prairie out and paved it over. And as inabsorbent as clay soils are, pavement is not absorbent at all, right? So we're creating a situation where there's nowhere for the water to go except to just sit on the ground. 
And, um, you know, that development has just continued unabated every year. It increases more and more of the coastal prairie is paved over and it increases our likelihood of flooding. And that's on top of, you know, the sort of increase, increasing severe storms and, you know, the greater rainfall, the stronger hurricanes, the more frequent hurricanes, et cetera. Um, now I've lost track of your question. <laughs> you were talking about um, uh, the book and remind me of yeah, your no, question. The, the, just the different temporal orientations because when you were oh, yes. about the sequoias, it was you know, the deep past, whereas yes. the Houston, it seems to be a repetitive past. Right, right. So, um, so thinking about these temporalities that we're, it's not just like, we can't even use the data that came from last year, because more of the coastal prairie has been paved over, right? It's, it's all kind of, um, it doesn't mean anything. And then even on a given street, if someone builds their house up on a huge berm, it increases the likelihood that the other people like there's nowhere for the, that the water that it places it displaces enough water that it increases the flooding likelihood of the other people on the street, right? So um, thinking of the temporality, like there's an expectation here, and I think in other places that we can continue to live as we always have, or ha as we have been doing, and expect a different outcome to occur. Um, one of the things that um, one of the essays in the Atlas by um, my colleague Dominic Boyer, um, professor in anthropology at Rice, he writes about um, hydraulic citizenship and about how we may have to live like we may have to build here differently, like we may have to start building our houses on stilts. Um, and that's a kind of you know, wackadoodle idea for many people here who's still very committed to, you know, cement slab foundations. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's more forward looking, it's more thinking about the future, like we can't continue to experience disaster and not change our way of living here if we're going to expect a different outcome. Um, so to sort of phrase that a slightly different way, if we want to continue living in these places and sort of become more, to live more gently, I guess, with this place um, and sort of to experience, um, to sort of foster more resilience, I guess, and, and to disaster and the way we live here, we have to change the way um, that, like our relationship to the land and the way that we use it um, and, and live on it. So earlier you spoke about the role of the author in coming up with solutions uh, and the role of storytelling when it comes to figuring out solutions. And now you were speaking about, you know, maybe changing ways of lives as a potential solution. solution. So I'm kind of curious, and this is also a question that comes from the Q&A session, um, the Q and A chat box. Uh, other than a writer in your life, you fit on all those other uh, roles and carry out those different projects. And one of them is the Houston Flood Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. So, could you tell us a little bit about what it is and how does it intersect with your writing and your, you know, activist aspirations? Sure. So, um, the Houston Flood Museum is, I mean, the kind of enduring artifact of it is the website, right? It's this website that exists and on the website are collected different kinds of stories about, um, I mean, mainly right now about Hurricane Harvey. There's a whole exhibit about Hurricane Harvey um, that includes, you know, um, stories that we collected from the community, but it also includes, um, you know, a few projects that we commissioned from Houston Public Media, one of which is a kind of um, series of video interviews. This sort of, there's a project here in the United States called StoryCorps, which is um, where people interview each other and sort of tell stories together. So it's in that kind of mode where people are talking to one another about their experience in Harvey. 
um, including, um, you know, the mayor and um, the, the person who was the county judge at the time and a mother and her daughter, you know, who had to sort of flee their house because of flooding. Um, so there's that project. And then there's a podcast about the history of hurricanes. There's short films. There are um, photography exhibits. There is a sort of collection of work that was being made um, or that was commissioned about flooding um, right after Harvey. But as the project continues, we're sort of, you know, thinking forward and backward in the past and sort of around us geographically. Um, so there's another project um, called Project Pleasantville on the website, which is about um, a neighborhood here in Houston, um, the Pleasantville neighborhood, which was um, one of the first um, African American planned or planned African American communities. It was created right after um, World War II. And they, it, and it's about their history of flooding as well. Um, you know, the, and um, one of the things that that project tries to do is to balance the story of disaster and calamity with, you know, this sort of community storytelling about itself, about why it's a beautiful community, why it's important. You know, it's a sort of history of um, civic activism and um, engagement and sort of t insisting on the dignity of this neighborhood. Um, and holding that together with the sort of climate violence that's being and has been inflicted on it and environmental violence more broadly. Um, you know, and then the Houston Flood Atlas, um, More City Than Water, the book that's coming out is also a sort of project of the Houston Flood Museum. Um, so, you know, the mission of the project is to exhibit the connections between human activity and catastrophic flooding especially is linked to wealth inequality and racial disparity um, in Houston and the broader Gulf Coast region in particular, but you know, potentially even wider than that um, in the future. Um, but again, the sort of website is the enduring artifact of our activities, but how I think about that project is a, a sort of repository for um, work that I guess what is on the website is not the sort of full work of the project of the museum. The project of the museum is to um, sort of create relationships with communities, with our community, beyond our community, um, to sort of, um, and sort of through those relationships and that community that we make and build around this issue in particular to kind of exert, to sort of act as a catalyst, right, for thinking about um, these issues more broadly. Some of the um, people who have contributed um, pieces to the museum, like it's not in their mission to think about flooding or think about environmental justice or environmental injustice. And sort of we're inviting them to think with that about us and just sort of bring more heads to the table, bring more people, um, you know, to the table and to think about this issue and to sort of force um, through that kind of um, collective gathering and imagining to hopefully begin to, to exert some force um, for progress on these issues. I'm going to follow this with a a little bit broader question on your work in general, but it seems, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to make this observation, but it seems that you went on this trajectory from exploring very personal, uh, also traumatic issues and going towards a more social, more, you know, but still as important traumatic issues. And also in the beginning, when we were speaking about House Morning Glacier, you mentioned that to you, nonfiction is about storytelling and telling stories to each other. And now you're mentioning that the ideal goal in, goal in some ways would be bringing more people to the table uh, when it comes to decision-making and figuring out new ideas. So I'm kind of curious whether this was, you know, a conscious decision to reorient your writing or is it something that just happened natural once you... I mean, I don't think of it so much as a reorientation because, you know, though I think, um, 
some of my earlier work, you know, the other side, for example, is, I mean, in one way, yes, it is about trauma. Um, but it's also about violence and the sort of, um, exploitation of power and undue sort of exerting the, the harm that occurs when one person exerts power over another, um, you know, and I don't really think that um, working on issues of the climate is a different subject from that. We are still talking about the violence that's inflicted when one person or one group of people exert power um, and exploit um, others, right? It's, it's the same, like there's, it's the same kind of subject. It's still about violence. And it's, um, you know, I, I think I'm still thinking about the same issues. It's just a, a kind of different scale, you know, thinking about the environment as, um, or, or the, you know, the earth as a, as a body, um, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking about the Gaia hypothesis, but, you know, about the, you know, thinking about um, the glacier, for example, as, and its death as being a violence that was inflicted. And though it's not in that article itself, some of my ongoing work is thinking about, you know, who committed that violence? Where did it come from? I think it's important that the researchers and some of the people who helped to organize that memorial have come from Houston. And Houston is the so-called energy capital of the world. Many of the emissions that have contributed to climate change um, and the melting of that glacier have come from here, right? And I think that's important to illuminate, um, but also to sort of think about the ways that people are tending and I mean that word in all its senses, right? With tenderness and paying attention to um, the harm and trying to repair it as much as we can. Um, so I think that that is not a realignment so much as, um, again, a sort of change in scale in, in my work. And this is a, what I'm gonna say next is also a reminder for folks who still haven't that they have the chance to drop a question at the Q&A session. And we still, still have a few minutes more, uh, but you know you're speaking about harm and we've spent so much time about today, about uh, so much time on speaking about changing directions, but we haven't spoken so much on undoing harm or restorative kind of justice. And there is this one question in the Q&A box that's a bit more general question on climate justice that I, I mean, of course, go ahead and let us know what climate just in, justice is to you, but I'm kind of, kind of want to make it a little bit more particular to the current conversation and ask whether you imagine some forms, forms of restorative justice when it comes to, you know, melting glaciers or when it comes to flooding. Um, yeah. Sure. So um, my last book, um, which is an essay collection called The Reckonings, um, was about justice. Um, and um, more broadly, you know, because when I would talk about the other side, which uh, very frankly is about, you know, I said it is about terrible violence, but I was kidnapped and raped by a person that I had been in a relationship with. And that's what the other side is about. And when I was on tour for the other side, and I will get to the climate justice, believe me, it's, it's what I'm saying is relevant. Um, but when I was on tour for that, people would say, what do you want to have happen to the man who did this to you? You probably want him dead, right? Um, and that was just like such a, it struck me as such a strange question. Like this is a per yes, this is a person who did terrible things to me, but it was a person who I had loved and I had been in a relationship like, and you want, you want you think I want him killed, like murdered? Like really, that seems like, um, I don't know, it just kind of blew my mind. And eventually through the course of sort of writing that book, which is um, about justice in many different forms, it's about 
um, what justice would mean for me, but also environmental justice. It's about um, criminal justice. It's about, um, you know, I write about Hurricane Harvey there in that um, collection. Um, but I think the sort of place that I finally come to at the end is that an injustice is anything, well, something that someone told me once, which resonated with me, was that an injustice is anything that gets between a person and their capacity for joy. And that I felt like perhaps justice is anything that can make the condition of joy a possibility again. And I think for issues of climate justice, it's not just a matter of like making joy possible, but making as much um, possibility for life and people to thrive um, in all its form and to experience joy, that joy is a form of thriving, right? That climate justice sort of, you know, if you think about here in Houston, for example, people who've been flooded, there's a neighborhood where, you know, homes have been flooded 10 times since Tropical Storm Allison in 2001. Um, what would it look like for those um, families to have their capacity for joy restored? And, and I don't think of this so much as restorative justice. I mean, I guess it's restoring the capacity for joy. But I think when we talk about restorative justice, I think too much, it's like, how do we put back the conditions that existed before the violence took place? But those conditions were what made the violence possible in the first place. And so I'm much more interested in transformative justice, in thinking about how do we transform these relationships that um, make violence possible into relationships that make joy possible, that make it possible for life to thrive, for people to be healthy, to have access to clean water, to clean air, to sort of a long and distant future, and to make it a possibility for us to imagine life continuing, you know, a thousand years from now, if we use that example from the beginning. Um, that I think that's a, that that kind of future and hope is um, part of what the work of climate justice is, is sort of making those conditions possible. But it's not prescriptive. It's not sort of one size fits all for every scenario. I am back. Uh, we're moving to a close and there is a, a really uh, wonderful question from Elizabeth. Uh, Constantine, would you like to, uh, to read it out? I'm very curious what uh, what Lacey's thoughts are on that. Sure, and it, it, it's a good question to kind of finish on because it's a very future-oriented question. Uh, but yeah, the question that our host, Elizabeth Gustavo, uh, posted is, what do you encourage your students to think about as they work on writing about climate change or climate change issues? So um, thank you so much for this question. I think, um, what I encourage my students to think about and work on is how climate change and the climate emergency is impacting them where they live, like how it affects us in a local way, because um, how it affects us in a local way and what kind of actions or solutions we can implement in local ways. Because I think when we try to think about climate change, right, as the, the you know, sort of giant, ob, you know, hyper object in my colleague Timothy Morton's term, it's just too big to imagine, and it's too overwhelming. Um, but if we think about, well, how is this affecting me in my community? How is this affecting my community? And to sort of write about this, I teach um, a class called Documenting Disaster. Um, <laughs> and the first semester I taught it was the first semester of the pandemic. So maybe uh, it's cursed. I don't know. It's possible. But um, I hope not. I hope to teach it again. But the students in that class, um, they were all tasked with sort of thinking about a, like a local disaster. And, you know, we talked about what that meant. Um, and, and the people in who had been affected by that and the people who were working to um, mitigate those disastrous effects on their community and to tell stories 
about not just about the sort of terrible things that happen, but the sort of people who are working despite odds to um, to sort of like um, protect their communities, to mitigate the harm, to restore um, that capacity to thrive and to experience joy in their communities. Um, and I think it gives students um, a really excellent set of tools that they leave feeling, I hope they leave um, feeling more hopeful and energized about what they can contribute as storytellers um, to this issue that affects us all. Thank you. Uh, and I think we're kind of out of time, so I'm just gonna end it here on my end, uh, but then over to Violet. Hey, thank you, thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Lacey. Uh, it was a great conversation, uh, very uh, eye-opening, but also poetic in a way. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, you can show us actually a book, Lacey, it's at the back, More City Than Water, the poetic maps of Houston. Uh, what a lovely addition. And um, Elizabeth, would you like to say a few words to wrap it up before I wrap it up? <laughs> well, I, I'd be honored to. I just want to thank you both so much for this. It was a thrilling discussion as far as I'm concerned. I wish, Lacey, I could be in your documenting disaster class. That sounds fantastic. And I was also very moved by your definition of justice which I think bears a lot of thinking about. And this has been really inspiring and beautiful interviewing as well. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you, our viewers, for joining our 2022 Capital Literature Writing to Save the World program. This event is organized with the financial support of Sofia Municipality and the National Culture Fund. We are looking forward to our next and final Capital Literature public event for this year. Poet and essayist Amy Nezukuma Tatil's virtual talk on writing about nature and on poetry writing amidst the climate crisis on July 26 at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time or 8 p.m. Eastern European Time. Head out to our social media outlets or subscribe to our newsletter at ekf.bg for more details on what's coming next. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day, evening, or whatever, in whatever part of the world you are. Stay healthy. <laughs>